Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 230 registered attendees for today's webinar. Our fourth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference in 2008 will be held in August in Nashville, Tennessee. So please make sure to save the date. Details are available on our website at ortodaylive.com. We will award an OR Today Live surprise pack to the first attendee today that can tell me what is the name of the world's largest rose garden, which is located in Texas. This garden contains 38,000 rose bushes representing 500 varieties of roses set in 22-acre gardens. Use the question feature now on your dashboard to answer the trivia question. While you are answering, I want to remind you, today's web webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's presentation. If you do not receive the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, and the winner of the OR Today Live prize pack is Jen Morris. Uh, congratulations, Jen. You knew that the correct answer was the Tyler Municipal Rose Garden. Congratulations. Our presenter today is David Taylor, who is the director of CVOR at Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. David, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Thank you for giving us your time today for this webinar series. Uh, my name is David Taylor and I am the director of the CVOR in San Antonio. I run a small little uh, cardiovascular OR and for the first time in my career I actually don't run a sterile processing department, although for 30 years now sterile processing has been part of my world. Um, in fact, I'm working towards several certifications in sterile processing. Today our topic will be integrated leadership, the SPD leader's role in building and sustaining exceptional outcomes through cultural transformation. And when I was building this presentation for this webinar, I really wanted to start looking at what was going on in our worlds every day because SPD plays such an important role in the surgical services department and how we are affected and or affect sterile processing uh, in return and how we treat and uh, represent our instrumentation and other devices that they process for us. So ladies, I don't have uh, control here. My keyboard's not working. So please bear with us folks. We've got a little bit of technical difficulty. There we go. Um, I have no financial di disclosure. Um, I am representing uh, myself in Methodist Hospital in today's endeavor. And the question that I have for so many of you is really why is it so important that we look at this um, perspective? And I think you can probably allude to many different items, uh, but some of the key ones is really looking at how um, Revenue is generated in our organization by surgical services. It is absolutely critical to the hospital's overall profitability. Um, hospitals today can uh, depend on greater than half of their net revenues for, from surgical services procedures themselves, as well as up to top line, uh, two thirds and top line revenue of up to 60% of the hospital's margin. So if, if the operating room doesn't run very well, and very efficiently, it can definitely impact the way we uh, provide care throughout our organization. In fact, some organizations um, rely so heavily on their procedural spaces uh, to run some of the non-profitable areas. So women's services, oncology, pediatrics, there are so many different service lines and community service projects that our hospital are able to provide um, services for or revenue to um, because of the successful areas such as the operating room. But as you know, perception is reality, right? So if we perceive our spaces to be well, um, 
well run, well perceived, then that's the way it is because that's what we're faced with on a daily basis. Um, but sterile processing leaders and their staff who perceive their department is running well are often surprised by the consultant or somebody who comes in with a, a fresh set of eyes and tells them really a different story. And sometimes this is partnerships with the various leadership in your organization. So for example, in my organization, um, this I don't have um, sterile processing responsibility. We actually have a director over that. Um, but but I can come into his department, I have a fresh set of eyes, just like when he comes into my department with a fresh set of eyes. But over the years prior to my role here, I worked as a consultant, and I would travel hundreds of different clients every year, and I would have the opportunity to grow um, with them and provide them with services or opportunities for them to provide input, process improvement, et cetera. And that's where this tagline kind of comes from. In these photographs that I'm going to show you, you're going to see some of the things that I experienced across the country and what sterile processing is faced with. As we know, instrument storage really needs to be in a controlled environment with great air exchanges, positive pressure, and low traffic. In this case, this client actually has windows to the outside atmosphere from their sterile processing. You have blinds in the windows, which were dusty. Um, the windows were single paned, as you can see from your screen, the window would um, condense and sweat based on the air temperatures outside in comparison to either the heat or the air conditioning. And if you look at the center photo, you'll see the window through that, the instruments, um, whether they're in a canister or in blue wrapper, were actually close to and or touching the window, which ultimately contaminated them with breakthrough. How we look at our instrument processing and packaging is just as important. In these client sites, you can see a couple different uh, photographs. One are instruments that are loaners, of course. We're getting them from represent, representatives um, of the companies for the implants we use. But if you look at that, you see a piece of tape that says set four, and then right below it, you have autoclave tape. Well, these things were prepared and ready for, for um, blue wrapper um, because they have already been through the cleaning process, um, but none of these stickers were removed. Um, if you're not familiar with some of the um, ST79 uh, requirements, you cannot steam sterilize these external tapes because um, they weren't designed to be sterilized from an internal packaging perspective. They're really designed for external packaging. You can see that on the picture on the right as well. You have external um, autoclave tape that's on the um, perforated basket. And then if you look inside the packaging, you can tell that there's brand new tape because it hasn't turned black yet. Um, they're using that to hold um, packaging or wrappers or whatever closed. The photograph that you see with the peel packs, I pulled those off of a shelf ready to use. And this was probably just a year or two ago. And these um, clients were actually folding the internal packaging for their wrappers. Um, and ST79 changed that standard many years ago, and yet it still happens where you'll find SPD departments that will use the internal packaging of their peel packs and fold them over to fit. Um, the reason we can't do that anymore is you create air pockets. And what um, Amy had found out was that if steam cannot penetrate those air pockets, then the item cannot be considered sterile. So just like when you do your dart test, you have to make sure that you have that dynamic air removal. This is the same concept. So if your nurses don't know, your circulators, or your, if yourself you don't know, um, this here is, is one of those things that um, is, is low-hanging fruit and can easily be changed, but yet it's often missed. This here, the next couple pictures I'm going to show you are the, the metal canisters that we are all familiar with. In this case, this is one um, lid to one canister. So all three photographs represent the same canister. And if you look at your left, you're going to see some grime. Well, that's really dust. And that is the left side filter. So if you look at the larger picture in the center, you'll see that magnification um, right there next to the um, ceramic filter. What's important here, though, is not just that grime, but the grime that's on the inside portion of the lid. Because this is a ceramic-based um, canister system, 
um, there's a second lid to it. So you, you actually have to remove uh, the spring-loaded latches in order for the, to separate the lid from the filters. And what you find there in the larger picture, you can kind of see um, the clump of dust. And on the right, I have a um, magnified photograph of it. Um, that is dust and lint that you get off of your scrubs and off your instruments and off of your blue wrapper, et cetera. The client that I worked with here didn't even have a clue that their canisters did that. So we had to go through hundreds of canisters to make sure that there was no dust. So technically, when you have these products, it's like bio burden, and you cannot sterilize that, not with steam sterilization at least. Here's another lid, um, a smaller canister, for example. The first picture will show it's intact. The second photograph, I've um, released the spring loaded and kind of turned the lid, the internal lid itself, and then you can see the dust bunnies that were in there. If you look really carefully on the picture on the right, you're going to see some hair. Uh, um, also embedded inside that. And it, it gets to a point where it gets a little bit scary, right? When you think about your sterile processing department supporting you in the surgical space, but it's also scary that we as nurses may not know that this type of stuff exists. Here the question is, do you have bugs really exist? And even though everything in this canister seemed appropriate with the blue filters, a bug was able to get in and was sterilized with the product. Um, and you can tell that because the bug is dead. And then if, if you look at the stain, I think that's kind of the blood that's existing from that bug itself. Um, but what's more important here is the maintenance of your canisters, right? We assume that they're going to last forever, and they don't. You actually have to maintain the seals, the gaskets, and the, the, the shape and, and um, consistency of your, of your canisters. Um, but take a look there of the um, glycine bags and other things that they use to wrap. They use an external um, autoclave tape um, to seal those packages. And again, that tape cannot be sterilized because steam, steam um, will not penetrate and sterilize the glue that's underneath that, um, that tape itself. What are you doing to manage um, your sterile processing equipment and or chemical maintenance. Um, here are some pictures of some autoclaves. If you open up the doors to your autoclaves, whether it's the top door that controls your, your operations when you have to do it manually, or if you look at the, the cabinet below, if you can open that, um, it may give you access to some of your controls. For most of us, those controls are in the back of your autoclave, but in some cases, based on the generation, you may find it in front. Here you're going to see a lot of dust and mildew and, and other things that have built up that they've not maintained and cleaned on a regular basis. The pictures to your right are actually going to show you the chemicals that we use in our washer decontaminators, which renders our, our um, instrumentation um, clean, but also safe to handle for the folks that are in your, your assembly areas. What's really alarming to me is all the sheets um, and blankets that they've used to absorb water. But if you look at some of those some of those jugs, they're empty. And in fact, the bottom picture has the one gallon jug that's kind of leaned over and they're hoping to grab, I guess, the last ounces or the last drops of that um, chemical. First, the chemicals are used to, to degrease and to um, uh, help eliminate bio burden. Um, if we're not using, if the chemicals are not present during the wash, their, uh, washer decontaminator cycle, um, we're going to have a much greater chance of having bio burden on our instruments. But we're also um, putting our staff at risk because in the assembly areas, we don't wear PPE to handle these instruments. What do you do to manage your loaner trays? Loaner trays are a huge uh, aspect of every OR because we cannot maintain and then number of instrument trays we need to, to manage our spine program, our orthopedic program, et cetera. In this case, loaner trays were just shoved in a room with everything else. Um, and this is actually sterilized items from other hospitals. So the vendors would drop them off here. Um, and there was no rhyme or reason or whether or not they got re-sterilized or inspected prior to use at this facility. And as you can tell, it wasn't just a loaner room. It ended up being a sharps container room, a external shipping box containers. There was anesthesia equipment in there. There's just parts and pieces. So it was really poorly done and poorly managed. 
How many of you have sterile processing departments that look like this? Um, things are everywhere. Everything's kind of mis, uh, misplaced or strewn about, and it's really difficult to find what you need when you need it. In some cases, it's not just sterile processing, but central sterile who combines not just the instruments, but the supplies themselves. How many of you have to bend over or reach your products? When you look at this aspect, you've got the one lady on the left whose backside is rubbing against the blue wrappers, and then the lady on the right is actually using the bottom shelf to try and reach equipment. So both instances, those instrumentations can be compromised and then being utilized on a patient. So we have to really manage our supplies, how we store these items, and what, what the impact is on sterile processing. I believe in what you accept is what you teach. If we're going to accept these behaviors and if we're going to accept these types of things within our organization, that's what we're teaching our staff. Far too often, we don't have educators to really bring um, our new nurses and new technicians kind of up to the ranks. They learn as they go. And if this is what they're seeing every day, this is what they find to be acceptable. So when we question people, they often, uh, often wonder or ask why. Um, why is it an issue? Why is it a problem? Um, so these are some variables that I think we can control, but looking at a cultural perspective, we have to really start changing the way we look at things and how we manage from day to day. The era of pay for performance started in 2007 with the Affordable Care Act. It really began with uh, coronary artery bypass uh, procedures, uh, primarily with mediastinitis. Uh, bariatrics was another specialty and orthopedic procedures also that, in, that included spine, neck, shoulder, and joint replacements. It's since grown, but the whole purpose of the Affordable Care Act was looking at how we will um, um, play a part of the surgical episode. As we all know from years past, surgery, your patient was admitted a week before, we would do the surgery, you'd stay in a hospital a week after, we'd maybe do some rehab, if we gave you an infection, you would, we would get paid for that infection. Um, if we gave you a UTI, we'd get paid for that. So there was really no incentive for us. But now as we look for the payment versus non-payment and maximizing these opportunities, hospitals are now being paid based on quality initiatives. And if we don't cert hit certain um, aspects of those quality initiatives, then we are the ones that are not receiving payment, which has a definite negative impact on our margins. But every team member has a role to play in this aspect of hospital-acquired infections or surgical site wo uh, wound infections. And it basically comes down to, you know, we're working for free and doing harm to our patients. But we're not alone in this. The world is now watching us, and mainstream media is reporting on these issues continuously. If it's not in the news, it's in the newspaper or some kind of publication that outs out an organization for the things that they are doing or the harm that they are causing to their patients. So our general public is acutely aware of what's going on, and they're starting to ask a lot of questions and starting to get really engaged into their health care. In this um, incident, I'd like to show you a video that um, I've come across, and I have a couple of them, and then I'm going to show you some other highlights, but take a look at this. Good morning on Today Investigates, an inside look at what goes on behind the scenes in the operating room. NBC News partnered with the Center for Public Integrity to tackle what experts think is a growing problem, dirty surgical instruments making their way into surgeons' hands. Dr. Nancy Seidemann is NBC's Chief Medical Letter. Dr. Nancy, good morning. Good morning, Annie. And over the years as I've walked into surgery, in my role as a surgeon and I've asked for an instrument, my assumption has been that everything that's been handed to me is a clean surgical tool. But what I've re recently learned is that sometimes that's not the case. I had to have surgery to repair my shoulder. I was not worried one bit. I knew they were going to take care of it. Like most patients heading into surgery, John Harrison put his faith and trust in the surgeon standing over him in the operating room. But unknown to most people, including John, surgery doesn't start in the OR. It starts here, in a basement of the hospital where instruments are cleaned, sterilized, and reassembled. But new research shows that too often, surgical tools leave the basement still contaminated with hidden blood, 
tissue and other debris, then used to operate on patients like John. We were told that the recovery time for rotator cuff surgery would be about six weeks, and just through physical therapy, his shoulder would be restored. That didn't happen. Something was wrong with my shoulder. Something was bad wrong. Two weeks after the surgery, John's wife, Laura, rushed him to the hospital where he was told he was infected with a potentially deadly bacteria during his surgery. It was a nightmare. It was, it was, it was really frightening. An investigation found that dirty surgical instruments had infected not just John, but seven patients at the hospital during a two-week period. And it's happening across the country with multiple outbreaks reported over the last two years. But because only 25 states are required to report surgical site infections, experts worry this is just the tip of the iceberg. If we do not do our jobs correctly, we can impact a patient's life. That's the reality. Sharon Green-Golden is the head of the sterile processing department at Bon Secours Hospital in Virginia, which is not the hospital where John was treated. She thinks of her team as the unseen patient advocate. It is a job that cannot be given to robots because the robot doesn't have the critical thinking to say, this is still dirty, I need to clean it some more. Sterile processing is one of the most important jobs in the hospital. Green Golden has made her sterile processing department state of the art, a model for what should be happening across the country. Yet she says in most hospitals, people who are paid to do this work are hourly minimum wage laborers. And in every state except New Jersey, are not required to have any kind of training or certification. Your hairdresser has to have a license. The barber has a license. The dog groomer has a license. The tattoo artist has a license. And I'm dealing with instruments going in your body. I'm not required to be certified. Johanna Cesi, a risk management clinical engineer at the University of Michigan Health System, has done eye-opening research that shows even when technicians follow cleaning instructions, Oftentimes, the instruments still contain debris. Oh, it's not even an old instrument. No. Oh, my gosh. Now you've shocked me. Now you've shocked me. I mean, I would think that that's perfectly fine, and you open it up, and that's pretty horrifying. A CG ran a tiny video camera through 350 suction instruments that had been sterilized and deemed ready for the OR. It looks pigmented. It could easily be blood. Or rust. Or rust. It shouldn't be there. Yeah. Okay. All contain some kind of debris. Do you know how many times in my life I've used a suction like this? Thousands. Thousands. Aware of the problem, the FDA recently had a meeting where Johanna Sisi presented his data. The FDA requires manufacturers to provide specific cleaning instructions for each surgical instrument. But the testing is done in a laboratory setting and not in the real world. And if a dirty medical device finds its way into an OR, the FDA does not require hospitals to report it. The FDA declined to do an on-camera interview for today, but gave us this statement. Hospitals are reminded to carefully clean and sterilize reusable medical devices. A patient's risk of acquiring an infection from a reprocessed medical device is very low. For John, what was supposed to be a six-week recovery has turned into a three-year nightmare. It changed my life. It, it changed every aspect of it. Thousands of days of waking up with pain. A surgery that was supposed to improve his life has led to seven other surgeries, constant pain, without full use of his arm. That's what I have to do. We asked the Advanced Medical Technology Association for a statement, and here's what they said. The medical technology industry is committed to providing patients with safe and effective medical devices and diagnostics. Ensuring the proper reprocessing of reusable medical devices is a shared responsibility between the FDA, device manufacturers, healthcare facilities, and physicians. Now, it is important to point out that this is a relatively rare phenomenon, the idea that you could get an infection going in for a clean surgery, but with the more advanced complex surgical instruments, the real issue is the cleaning now has become a much more difficult process. And again, I want to thank the Center for Public Integrity because they were a real help in, with this investigation. It's and very important reporting. You think that they should be certified, the people then who clean these instruments. There's no reason not to have it certified. I mean, we went to the University of Michigan where they have the money in the bowels of the hospital to really have a big reprocessing uh, plant. But as you look at community hospitals where this becomes a, a, you know, an expensive process, 
encourage them third party to do it. I think, frankly, this is a shared responsibility where the ball is being dropped. Who pays? The patient pays. Mm. Again, then it comes down to the First, do no harm. At the end of the day, no matter who you are in the medical system, first, do no harm. Dr. Nancy Sutterman, thank you so much. You Important reporting this morning. So as you can see from that video, and I know it was a little bit long, but it was very poignant, and it's kind of the things that we're faced with every day. And when I went back and looked at some of this after finding that video, I really started looking at the industry, and I started doing some searches. And what I found is uh, one of the first things that kind of popped up was in 19, and sorry, 2005, which is uh, 12 years ago, um, North Carolina Hospital washed instruments in hydraulic fluid, and that was Duke University. And the story behind that is it, it was just human error. Um, nobody would have predicted, but it was all the processes in place that affected thousands of patients. And the story was that sterile processing um, put some empty 50-gallon um, detergent containers on the loading dock, and an elevator company came in to repair uh, an elevator and needed to remove hydraulic fluid and needed to put that fluid somewhere. They found those detergent barrels they utilized those barrels but did not label them and placed them back on the dock. And lo and behold, somebody from sterile processing or supply chain or some other factor that involved the process returned those items full as expected to be new to sterile processing and they utilized them in their um, washer decontaminator process. It wasn't until hundreds of cases later that a surgeon started complaining and thought the instruments were greasy Nothing was really done, and then weeks later, it was identified as hydraulic fluid. Um, Duke University had to follow all of those patients, and you can only imagine how difficult that was, and then finally settled the lawsuit with the uh, elevator company in 2008. Because it's a sealed case, nobody really knows the outcome, but we do know that patients were affected. Five women were allegedly uh, contracted staph infections during surgery um, at the Columbia St. Mary's uh, Hospital. Um, this was also reported not only on ABC, but in Outpatient Surgery Magazine. And this surgeon actually uh, blames the hospital for allegedly um, having dirty instruments. And here's the actual footage from that physician uh, that made it to the news. The hospital is accused of making cuts in its infection control program that resulted in an increase in invasive infections. Colleen Henry joins us with a follow-up to the 12 News investigation. Well, Toya, the trial is the first in a series, women who sued Columbia St. Mary's after contracting an invasive infection. And for the first time, we're hearing from the witness at the center of the case, an orthopedic surgeon turned whistleblower. When 12 News first revealed the hospital infection allegations last fall, Dr. James Stoll was bound by a gag order. Unfortunately, I'm under a judicial order not to speak about these uh, events. Yesterday, Stoll told a jury he believed dirty surgical instruments resulted in an increase in staph infections like the deadly MRSA at the old Columbia Hospital back in 2008, including that of plaintiff Cindy Patrick. And in a very short period of time, in July, August, September, and October, there were four infections in a very short period of time. Now free from the gag order, Stoll told 12 News a budget crunch caused by the construction of Columbia St. Mary's $400 million lakefront campus resulted in cuts in Columbia's infection control department. We learned about it after the fact, only when we started asking questions and when problems started cropping up. Then, he says, Columbia St. Mary's turned on him. Administrators sent Stoll a letter after learning he'd warned a patient about high infection rates at Columbia. The letter reads, those who are aware of health care services review information are obligated to keep it confidential and not disclose it to anyone. And the hospital threatened to sue Stoll for slander. I was mortified. Absolutely mortified. Stoll agreed to testify against Columbia. Today, the hospital declined to talk on camera, but this afternoon, Columbia St. Mary's expert witness refuted Stoll's claim. There's no evidence that a third instrument was used in Ms. Patrick's surgery. The infectious disease specialist testified that steam sterilization kills infectious microorganisms even on instruments that look dirty. But the more likely cause of Patrick's infection was her own skin. The majority of the 
surgical uh, infections are not caused from microorganisms outside our body. They're caused from microorganisms on our skin. Late this afternoon, Columbia St. Mary's issued a statement. It says complies with the judge's gag order. Quote, this is only the second day of testimony. In the coming days, we trust that Channel 12 will also report on the testimony of our other nationally renowned expert witnesses. And Columbia Hospital closed last year. Yeah, right. It merged with St. Mary's at the new Lakefront campus. Now, the Patrick case is expected to run through next week. There are several other cases still working their way through court. All right. Thanks, Colleen. So you can take what you want from that news report, but obviously um, hospitals or lawyers or judges or courtrooms or news reporters are going to take what they can from that because obviously they want to win. It's a competition. But here's another one that was reported in the Center of Public Integrity, Filthy Surgical Instruments, the Hidden Threat in America's Operating Rooms. This was in 2012. You know, overlooking outbreaks of CRE linked to GI endoscopic. So it's not just instruments, it's our scopes. You know, are your scopes safe? You know, Superbug found at Suburban Hospital uh, Lutheran General, which is in Chicago. That was in 2014. That was reported in the Chicago Tribune. Scopes disinfection failure suspected in Superbug cluster leads UPMC to alter their methods. This was um, in the Trib Live. This was in 2014. This one in USA Today, how many travelers get this at their hotels and um, at the airports? Um, on the front page, I highlighted it in the blue bubble, but that's where the um, headline was, which was easy, could be easily missed until you opened up the newspaper and you find an entire page dedicated to this particular uh, incident. Deadly superbug infected patients in Seattle Hospital, Fox News, and the Seattle Times. An outbreak of multi-drug resistant superbugs spread by contaminated endoscopes. At least 32 patients at Virginia Mason Medical Center between a two-year period, 11 of them died. Forbes magazine, nightmare bacteria and dirty scopes, ignorance and want medicine. Here you get another one, 281 patients affected exposed to drug resistant E. coli. Los Angeles, service. This cross-spectrum of our entire U.S. Superbugs at the second Los Angeles hospital. Not just the first, but the second. That was in 15. Seattle Children's. 12,000 children and young adults treated at this hospital um, could be at risk for infection from surgical instruments. Dirty scopes infected 16 Huntington Memorial Hospital patients, including 11 who died. 11 people died because of the the uh, processes that we currently have in place. 293 patients exposed to hepatitis and HIV. The VA isn't alone in this. Uh, VA Medical Center more recently in 2006 um, had faulty uh, sterilization procedures and incorrect potentially unsterile surgical equipment used on patients. A, women wor a woman worried over hospital accidentally using unsanitary tools during surgery. And it continues, and nobody's immune. So in 2011, Amy, the FDA, and Medical Device Reprocessing Summit occurred. Um, they came up with some clarion themes, and they were trying to gain a consensus of how clean is clean, and wanted to start adopting some new definitions and creating new standards so that there'd be clear instructions that could be repeatable by our employees. Um, they figured that if we paid early and invested properly that we would have um, better reprocessing requirements throughout the design reprocessing um, uh, process. So working with manufacturers on actually dev devising um, instrumentation and or scopes and or whatever we are using as we move forward with technology in our future, how does that impact us at the end? As we all know, it's our responsibility to follow manufacturer's instructions. Um, some of those manufacturer instructions are so arduous and difficult to follow that how do you get the end user, your employees, to be able to manage that on a regular basis? Um, the nice thing that came out of this is there was lots of conversation and discussion. And the first video alludes to that one gentleman uh, who is a subject matter expert was able to report to the FDA. 
These supporting organizations were the American Gastrological Association, AORN, which we're all familiar with, APIC, which is the infection control folks, AST, ISHIN, which is our instrument sterilization folks, um, Cigna, as well as the Joint Commission. So there were many organizations involved in this um, because it's important and because there has been so many outbreaks and so many patients affected, um, we have to get engaged and involved and we need to stay involved. And that's where the culture comes in. Um, you heard in the testimony from the expert, steam sterilization does clean microorganisms, but if there's bio burden, the instrument underneath that bio burden is no longer sterile. And if that bio burden chips off, then we have a non-sterile instrument and we are um, technically um, taking a risk of infecting our patients. So the FDA focuses on reprocessing of these medical devices. And looking, at, looking from uh, guidance from the industry as well as the FDA, they issued in 2015 a document um, uh, titled Labeling and Reusing Medical Devices for Reprocessing in Healthcare Facilities. This was later um, updated in two, uh, 1996. I'm sorry, uh, this was later updated in 2016, but initially issued in two, uh, 1996. Um, Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, has put out an official health advisory that talked about healthcare facilities need to review their procedures for cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilizing reusable medical devices. We all do the DART test and the biologicals, but do we all do them well? Does all the staff understand how those processes work? Do they understand what to do and where that's, uh, what the responsibilities are to escalate issues when there's failures? a lot of information here, but the culture starts with the perioperative piece. I don't know how many of you in the audience started your career 30 plus years ago, but back in the day when I started my career, we actually put our own instruments up at the end of the day. Now granted, we didn't have as many as we do now, but our responsibility was really to clean the instrument as we used it. So the point of use is where the instrument should begin its cleaning process. But far too often, the pressures of turning over your rooms or getting your room started, et cetera, not having enough instruments to begin with, turning those instruments over rapidly is causing this to kind of fail. Surgical technicians at the table should be wiping the instruments and cleaning them as they use them, but unfortunately, that doesn't always happen depending on the complexity and the severity of the case. But we know that this helps to prevent the biofilm um, buildup as well as pitting or other issues that are caused by the organic soils and those so organic materials drying on the instrument itself. Um, some instruments are so difficult to clean, like our neuro instruments, that it makes it extremely difficult once it gets through this um, decontamination space of sterile processing. But SPD also has responsibilities. And then you've seen some of the videos. I don't know if that's all related to the same organization. But you noticed how intertwined all of those ringed instruments were and how they were using the enzymatics. But did you see anybody opening the lock boxes to make sure that the enzymatic got inside? You know, we only seen bits and pieces, so we can only assume. But what, what is happening from the surgical perspective and then what happens when SPD gets those instrumentation? Are all the jointed instruments opened and inspected? They should be. Um, are all the hinged instruments carefully looked at? Are they opened and accessible to the water and to the detergents and to the enzymes that we are using? Um, so these are things that are in place um, that we know to do, but are we doing them on a daily basis? Do we hold our staff accountable for it? Well, the best way to get started is really to stop talking about it and actually begin doing it. And that's what Walt Disney was quoted as saying. He was a doer. Um, and he encouraged his, um, his artists, his imagineers, and his people to do great things. So how do we embark on this cultural change? Well, it begins by building the right organizational culture to begin with. It's imperative that your SPD leaders make operational and strategic changes necessary to solidify long-term gains, not only in performance, but how do you enhance the outcomes of those uh, folks' work Creating a strategic plan or vision for sterile processing is key. And then sharing the plan and vision with all the members of the team. It's kind of hard to create a vision and embark on a culture change if the members of your team don't understand. Some of you have mid-shifts, 
evening shifts, weekend shifts, night shifts, etc. Um, do all those members understand what the vision are is in, in the cultural transformations you're about to undertake, or do only the day shift people know about it? Developing your mission statement. Well, we can create a mission statement, right? Committed to providing an efficient service oriented and fiscally responsible. Enter the name of your department, whatever that may be, which exceeds the expectations of the customers uh, while optimizing safe, effective care. I can't see my audience, of course, because this is a webinar, but I'd either get some nods and smiles or, you know, maybe a commitment from you guys that says, yeah, that's pretty good. But I would question you or challenge you on this because is that really effectively covering a mission of your organization or your department? And I would say that this might be just a little bit better. And this is our sterile processing department is dedicated to providing services that meet or exceed the requirements and expectations of our customers. We will actively involve all members of the organization in the pursuit of continually improving quality processes and customer satisfaction. So divergently different, still in the same positive path, but really articulates better what's going to occur and what they're going to do to make their customers, the end users, more satisfied, ultimately improving the patient's safety. <clears throat> Techniques for creating and hardwiring these changes are not easy. Cultural transformation doesn't occur overnight. Um, I want you all to know that cultural transformation can take years, um, but it begins with you, the, you, the leader. It begins with the organization itself and then supporting the mission of trying to do it better. So being transparent is hugely important. Um, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and sharing this information with your staff is great, but also being transparent about information um, that, that occurs at the system level or the organizational level. You engage directly with your stakeholders. In some cases, your stakeholders are your surgical technologists and first assists who are using these instruments every day, and sometimes they're your surgeons. What I find really great about hardwiring these change and making this cultural transformation is when you have SPD techs that actually will enter the surgical suite and talk with the physician about the issues that they're faced with. This puts a name, um, uh, a name and face to the instrument set that was put up by that individual, but it also engages them with the surgeon directly so that they understand kind of what they're faced with and why it's so important. Performing walkabouts, as an executive, uh, as a leader, you, you, are you walking about your, your areas? Um, some of you have so many areas, I know it's difficult, but how often do you get into the bowels of, um, of sterile processing and understand really what they're faced with on a daily basis? Do you have sponsor engagement, meaning from your CNO, your COO, your CEO, et cetera? How do you cultivate these advocates that support the SPD department? Ultimately, what we find is it's hard to find SPD people that are trained and experienced. We usually train our own. They come from the street or from our EVS department. They're usually not skilled labor. And we have to kind of create those worlds. In the video, you've seen the lady talk about the hairdresser, the barber, the tattoo artist. All of those folks needed licenses. And yet, many of us don't have a certification program or a career ladder that's developed for our SPD people. How often are you having meetings and do you have regular meetings where you can talk about these issues and start growing your people? And then what is the accountability factor? Do we hold everybody accountable to include ourselves? And then ultimately, how do you measure your progress? Because with data, we have power. So developing our employees, it's important to um, have an understanding of the knowledge and skills of your teams and what are the critical differentiators of your hospital um, but many organizations put little emphasis on staff development. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to go to conferences because I either speak or I'm on a board, uh, but I have a great boss who allows me to go to conferences uh, on a pretty frequent basis. Um, but how many of you, and if I had a show of hands, we'd see that from the audience, but how many of you really get a chance to get away from your hospital and get some really great information and tools that you can use on a daily basis? The numbers are probably very low. If you, if you dumb that down into the different layers that you have and the different responsibilities, how many of you actually sent a sterile processing te technician um, to Isham? 
if you've done it, you should be very proud because I will tell you that the numbers of SPD technicians that actually go to ISHM is very few. Do you provide your staff with regular opportunities to grow? You know, do you have guest speakers or motivational speakers come into the department if you can't send them somewhere? Um, local, state, and national conferences, what are you doing there? Are you using industry reps to come and give you in-service things? Um, or are you so hard pressed for staff and so hard pressed for time because that you don't have even time to give your staff um, the opportunity to learn on the job? You have career ladders or develop succession plans so that you can grow your people from the street or from an EVS perspective as they come into your department and, and develop them into leaders for tomorrow. Do you have certification programs where you're willing to educate, train, and pay for the certification of your staff? These are some key things in developing your employee. The employee empowerment training and partnering are foundational of high quality customer service. Um, the hotel and food industry do a great job at this, and they educate all of their, their people at all levels. Um, what are we doing in healthcare? I found this great quote from Herb Keller, and he was the co-founder and former CEO of Southwest, and he's basically saying that they are willing to, tra to hire untrained and unskilled labor if they have the right attitude versus those who have all the skill and aptitude but have a really bad attitude. And what he says here in the last sentence of his quote is, we can teach people how to provide customer service, but we can't change their DNA. So how do we involve personnel in this collaborative leadership as we look at cultural transformation? Well, I believe in team participation in the decision-making process. I think that frontline staff can help us solve a multitude of our problems because they're faced with the results every day. So creating multi-level task forces that include um, not only reviewing and updating the current practices, uh, but creating growth opportunities and operational development priorities. What is a priority for us as a leader may not necessarily be the priority for our front line users. So by having them engaged in these task forces, they can help guide us so that we can make better decisions. By encouraging this, the frontline staff can actually change and drive your cultural initiatives because they have a buy-in early in the process. We need to make sure our communication is effective, okay, and make sure that it counts. We have to be creative in our techniques. We have to make sure that we're communicating not just our successes but our failures as well as hospital-wide hospital safety events. It may not relate to the OR or to the surgical, I mean, sterile processing department, but it does have an impact on the way people think. So by sharing safety events, it can definitely be very powerful. Um, communicating effectively does take effort, though. The cost of poor communication is four out of 10 people say that the company leadership is ineffective. 22% they lack communication causes conflict in the workforce, and 40% says it manifests in lost productivity. 40% is huge when you're trying to turn over instruments. And 32% said that it causes low morale and high turnover, and that's something we can afford in our areas. It's also estimated that $37 billion is the total cost to employee misunderstanding. If they don't understand what we're talking about or where we're going, it's definitely going to cost us and affect our margin. In fact, in companies that have 100,000 employees, they lose about $62.4 million a year. And in most companies, this results in about $26,000 in lost revenue per employee. So how do we create the sustainable enthusiasm? Well, you gotta have fun at work. If you can't have fun at work, nothing gets done. Also start building esprit de corps within our teams, the police, uh, military, fire, sports teams, CrossFit people, they all have this really cohesive team and this whole new attitude about supporting one another. Look at recognition, wall of fame, uh, wall of excellence, bringing your A game. These are all things that can help instill um, something to be proud of at your organization. Um, rewarding positive behavior and successes, even if it's just small achievements. If we recognize these people publicly, it helps them to buy into what we really want them to do. Do we engage employees? This is a picture of me and my team, all in white t-shirts, um, supporting breast, breast cancer. And the employee on the left who's smiling 
Um, he's to my right. So the right of your picture, um, he's the one that initiated this. He asked permission. I said, let's do it. We raised about $3,000, and we supported not only him and his adventure, but several members from our team came that day to support him and his family who had suffered from this disease. Do you have fun at work? Do you put yourself um, in front of your staff, and are you present? Here is a hat contest that I was involved in uh, that my employees turned, uh, made a hat, made me wear it during this hat contest. Well, that hat turned into a wrestling mask and a wrestling outfit, et cetera. Um, it was fun. We won a second place trophy, and it was the first time we ever did that. It was just an absolute win for us. This employee, when I first got to work, wore a hat that said, I leave at three. Well, on this particular day, he said he wasn't feeling so good, and as he turned to me, he said he had pink eye. Um, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. He made everybody laugh that day, and we had a great time. Uh, Joseph is a very good friend of mine and works for a competitor. One day, he started trying to make people a little bit happier by talking like a pirate, and then they ended up making him a parrot and taped it to his shoulder, and we all started laughing that day and looked at, at all of the difficult tasks that we had to accomplish a little bit differently. The three definitions that I pulled off of the website, um, uh, Google, was for esprit de corps and really looking at some of the key themes here, which was loyalty, enthusiasm, strong regard, devotion, pride, fellowship. These are common themes for esprit de corps. So how do we build that team and work together? Well, one day I did a surgical hula hooping contest, and in this contest um, we had everybody hula hoop um, as they entered the operating room that day. Uh, the two ladies on your left, on the top and right, are nuns, um, because this was a Catholic institution. I have a physician, and in the top right, I have a COO, and in the bottom right, I have a CNO. Everybody got engaged that day. We all laughed a little bit. We challenged ourselves, and we were just a little bit different with one another. Do you take pride in ownership? Do you maintain the department? Do you give the tools that your staff need to manage? Utilizing success, it's typically a, a lean term, but 5S is what we use, but I added a success because safety is so important. What are you doing to grow as a leader? Are you giving yourself opportunities to grow? Are you becoming certified? Do you read professional development? Do you read your journals and OR magazines or SPD magazines? Do you take part in professional organizations? Are you a member of a local chapter? Um, are you on a community board? Do you volunteer, not just with your staff, but do you volunteer in other activities? Do you have journal clubs within your organization? And ultimately, do you take time to relax? If you can't have fun in your personal life because you're always working, how are you going to be effective when you come to work? Here's a picture of my wife and I with the uh, rock band, The Scorpions. If you all know them, we got a chance to meet them and took some photographs of them and uh, with them, and uh, we just had a really great time. But what I will tell you is that the risks to, associated with cultural change are high. What can fail? Well, culture will change, might not change. It might take you a lot longer to change the culture than you anticipated. There could be alienation of people, stakeholders, whatever. You might have attrition. You might have some staff that refuse to change uh, their evil ways, and uh, either they quit or you end up firing them because you can't get them to do the things that they need to do appropriately for patient care. You know, ultimately it could fail, but I tell you that if you really work hard at this and you continue to drive some of these initiatives and make some simple changes, it won't fail and you will see change happen. James, works, James York said the most successful people are those who are good at plan B. So I will tell you that as you start trying to change um, your organization, as you try to change certain things, some things just might not work, even with the utilization of frontline staff on your task forces or committees. The one thing that I will tell you, though, is that most process improvement plans have multiple variables, and those multiple variables um, is what matters. So if you have, say, five variables to a process improvement plan and the plan's not working well, it may just because, it may be because by one of those variables. If it's one variable that isn't working, adjust that variable, but continue the process until you see true change. I will tell you that it's not all bad. 
Some things occur and some things don't, but if you get engaged and you keep your team well, um, apprised of what's going on, you communicate well, you're going to see some things change. My motto in my life is if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. So here are three, three of my staff members who are constantly cleaning their equipment. Um, this includes my RN, because if I'm willing to mop the floors and take out trash and do the things that I need to do, um, that I expect them to do it. So I don't have any sticky goo, I don't have any grime, I don't have anything on my walls or my equipment because we're constantly engaged in doing things. Um, and this is the same for sterile processing. I work with my partner downstairs, that director, he has a very clean department because we all engage in the same philosophy. Here are some key pictures. I showed you some of the negative pictures, so I wanna show you some of the positive things that SPD departments are doing. They have a three sink system, which is appropriate, and you see the water fill line in the middle picture, and then I highlighted that a little bit more to the picture to your right. This is particularly a stairs company, um, not to advertise or, or, or advocate for them, but what I wanted to show you here was that one gallon jug that you've seen um, in the very first part of this presentation. Here's an example of how this works. So uh, the picture on your left is a calibrated device that actually sucks the appropriate fluid based on the fill level, how many gallons are up to that water line, um, and it is programmed to deliver the appropriate amount of enzymatic cleansers so that the sterile processing person can clean their equipment properly. Here's the same device utilized on a much larger scale for the washer decontaminator. Um, very effective. Um, and that little blue container, which actually holds the, the, I think these are three gallon jugs, that holds them a little bit at an angle so that the, the hoses or the straws, if you will, um, can effectively reach all of the fluid. Here's some sterile processing uh, departments who've really cleaned up their act and utilized the metal shelving on an accordion system so that they can locate um, supplies, equipment, and instrumentation very rapidly and very easily. It's kind of low tech, but it definitely is workable. What you're gonna see on the end there in yellow are their locator files. So they had this down to a science. So new employees, whether it was from surgical area or from sterile processing, could find what they needed when they needed it pretty quickly. Here's a more high-tech solution. This is, again, another company in the industry. Um, it's called Hanel, H-A-N-E-L. It's a German company. Again, I'm not advocating for them, but they have a vertical storage system that you can put all of your instruments, supplies, implants, et cetera, in a vertical center. And instead of um, doing what we did prior, like this, do everything horizontally in an accordion fashion, this is done very simply in a vertical fashion, and all the staff does is print, uh, um, punch in a few keys on the computer keypad. The um, rotor mat roll, uh, rolls inside until that instrument shelf shows up. You pull those instruments or supplies off the shelf. Very effective at what it does. Here's another couple pictures of it showing some instrumentation. Um, that's the same cabinet, just different angles so that you get a better perspective of it. One thing I will tell you that no matter what we do, everything matters. And in the in the long term, uh, in the in the long history of mankind and animal kind to those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. That's all I have for slides. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them for you. Um, if there's no questions, I am so glad that we've had this hour together. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives to be with me today. Hey, David, this is Jamie. Thank you for the presentation. I know we've reached our 60 minutes, but we do have a couple of questions from attendees that I'm going to see if we can get through a few uh, before launching the post-webinar survey. So if you're up to it, let, let's kick off uh, Q&A. Wonderful. Good. First question I have, you showed some interesting pictures in your presentation. Why do you think so many SPD departments are getting it wrong? I think it begins with our training programs and then what we have access to do. 
Um, as we know, as surgical services leaders or steroid processing leaders, we know that we have so much that we are faced with. Um, it's very difficult for a sterile processing um, individual or a team to process as many instruments um, as they are faced with on a daily basis. You know, take orthopedics, for example. You might have 20, 25 loaner trays that have to be processed. And in many cases, those loaner trays sometimes don't show up until the day of surgery. So you're racing through things. So one, lack of education. Two, we have to cut corners because in order to get the stuff done, to get the widgets to the OR, um, we have to make um, judgment calls. And I think a lot of times our staff are not empowered to say, you know what, it's going to take two hours or it's going to take four hours or it's going to take six hours because then you have a surgeon screaming or you have administration screaming or somebody screaming, we need this, we need this. But they don't often listen that, hey, you know, I've been training this individual. They've never put these instrument sets up. Um, we need to spend some time educating them. And usually the orientation is really um, uh, minor, if you will. Um, they learn on the job. They kind of learn as they go. And very few, very few organizations have systems in place and technology to augment that training opportunity. Thank you, David. Since we've we've met our 60-minute allotment, I'm going to go ahead and just all attendees, if you did submit a question today, we'll send it to David offline so he can follow up with you. I want to be mindful of the hour that we agreed to today. So with that, thank you, David, for a great webinar. A reminder to the attendees that one lucky attendee today will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will appear on your screen shortly, but if you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. You must complete the survey to obtain the certificate. For information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. We'll see you all back next month. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>